Okay, welcome back to the Bio 153, 155 channel of YouTube and to part two of um, our online mini lecture. And uh, I, the first part I talked about, the pre-assessment that we did of scientific writing and scientific reasoning, and now I want to talk about the experiments you guys did in, in class this week with termites. And these experiments were designed around um, an observation that someone made that uh, while they were hiking and carrying a field notebook that some termites landed on the page and seemed to follow the writing on the page. And uh, the hypothesis then that we had you guys um, evaluate is um, that termites are orienting to some substance in the ink. Something in the ink is attractive to these termites. And the prediction that, we, that that makes then is if you cover one side of a page with ink lines, which we had you do, and leave the other side of the page blank, termites will spend more time on the side of the page with the ink lines than they will on the blank side. So we had you guys do that. And um, just like in the London and Jean paper and how their treatment and control nests were paired based on location, we paired your uh, treatment and control trials based on location. So um, each gray box is a pair. Okay, Each gray box indicates a table, actually, because we had them paired by table. And uh, you can see there are six here, just like there are six tables in each of our uh, rooms. And um, I should say, I didn't mention uh, in the first part, that the reason that London and Jean... Uh, decided to use a pair design for their wasp nest study is because they thought that there was very likely um, some areas in the, on the landscape where the threat from parasites was probably higher than others. So by um, putting their treatment and control nests in pairs, that way they could control for um, spatial differences in risk of parasitism. So for example, if... Um, a lot of parasites emerged from um, all the nests in a certain area, their design uh, presumably would still show more parasites coming from the treatment than from the net, than from the control. So they would still find, detect that difference uh, that they might not if they were not using a paired design. So a similar along those lines, uh, there might be um, things in different parts of the room that termites orient to. So we broke things down uh, spatially just like they did for this experiment. So anyway, <clears throat> you can see graphically how we had it set up. So treatment and control. Uh, the black ink line is on side A of the treatment page. Side B is blank. And then the, for the control, there's A and B. A and B are both blank. They're both identical. So we would expect then if termites are going to spend more time orienting, um, if they are in fact orienting to um, something in the ink line, they're going to spend more time on side A here. Okay. So in the next slide, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show you how the data are distributed. Uh, before I do that, let me remind you that your trials were two minutes and um, you released termites concurrently, so at the same time or simultaneously for the treatment and the control. And then you have um, four numbers for each, for each trial. You have the amount of seconds that termite one spent on A sub T, or side A in the treatment, the amount of time out of two minutes that the termite spent on side B, or B sub T for the treatment. And then in the control, the second termite, you have the amount of seconds they spent on side A and side B also. So there are four um, bits of data, but the comparison we're going to make is just between the time spent on side A for the treatment versus the control. Okay, so you guys are going to get an Excel <coughs> spreadsheet, excuse me, an Excel spreadsheet with um, the data that the termite, the termite spent on side A of the treatment and then side A of the control. And I said there was uh, about 200 pairs. Um, you can see there's only 10 rows here. But I just did that because I couldn't fit 
obviously all of those on one slide, but you will get an Excel file with um, all 200 pairs. So in this column will be the time spent in seconds on side A sub T um, in the treatment trials. And then on in this column here will be the time spent on in column A sub C for the control trials in seconds. The third column here is the difference between the two. So we're going to subtract uh, column A sub C from column A sub T. And uh, our null and alternative hypotheses here then are if there's no relationship between presence of ink and termite orientation, we would expect that um, they'd be equally likely to be in either um, A sub T or A sub C, and uh, the difference, the average difference between the two would be zero. The alternative hypothesis uh, would be that D is not equal to zero. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we're able to do a paired t-test for our analysis of these data. Uh, the London and Gene study had to use a sign test, which is a, a much less powerful statistical test. They had to do that because they had a very small sample size, uh, among other reasons. And uh, because we have lots of sections and lots of students, we were able to collect a lot of data and use a more powerful test. And when I say a powerful test, it's a test that is more likely to, um, to find uh, differences um, in, in your data set when they're there. Okay? So this is the, the um, formula for how, the, how a t-statistic is calculated. Now, you don't have to memorize this, but I just wanted to show you where the numbers come from. So when you guys calculate a t-statistic, when you do the t-test this coming week, um, the t-statistic will be calculated using um, d-bar, which is the mean difference between those two columns, divided by the standard error of d, the difference. And the standard error, um, it's, it's a... It's an estimate of the reliability of our data. It basically, standard error it means if we perform this experiment many, many, many times, um, the D, the average difference that we would get would be slightly different every time. And there would be a distribution of D bar then. And um, the standard error um, is a measure of the spread of a D bar in that if the if the experiment was repeated many, many times. And so standard error is typically something we, we report to give the reader an idea of how variable our results are. And you can see there that standard error is calculated from standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So standard error is very heavily affected by uh, our number of observations, or n, it tends to go down when we have a very large sample size. And in this, in this study, we have a very large sample size, so we should have a pretty low standard error. Um, and so if we go down the list of things here, D bar I already talked about. Standard deviation is something that you will um, calculate for most of, uh, most of the data collection you guys do. And it's just a measure of the spread in our data. So how much, uh, how much spread is there in our data? Standard error I already talked about. And um, n is just simply the number of our experimental units. Okay? So for class next week, we're going to give you guys an Excel spreadsheet with all the class data. Um, we're not going to make you calculate the t-statistic by hand, but we're going to let you use an online uh, t paired t-test calculator. And you'll just have to cut and paste the data from those two columns into that online calculator. And um, that will give you the mean difference. It will give you the standard error of the difference. And it will give you the paired t-statistic. T it will give you a p-value that corresponds to that t-statistic and degrees of freedom. Now, degrees of freedom are the sample size minus 1 in this case. Um, and that's another topic that we could probably talk about um, at another time. And then you'll decide whether or not you can reject the null hypothesis for the class data based on the p-value. 
Okay, just like we talked about, um, just like we talked about interpreting p-values for the um, in the first part of this mini lecture with the WASP experiment, you guys will get a p-value for the class data, and you'll need to make a determination about whether you can either accept or reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so you're then going to um, uh, create a graph of the data. You're going to uh, write up the results in an abstract, um, very similar to how you did uh, in the first week, and you'll do that. Um, you'll do that next week, and um, your TA will give you a lot more information on, on how to do that next week. Okay, I'll see you guys in class next week, and uh, let's beat Louisville.